The Starship project will be remembered for centuries or millennia as the most powerful, efficient, and cost-effective rocket. Space exploration has advanced by five years, which would have otherwise taken several decades thanks to it, to clarify what I mean. In 1980, putting a kilogram into orbit cost $85,000. Starship will lower the price to $1.20 per kilogram under $1,500. Will you be able to go to space? But honestly, could Elon Musk still change something about Starship's design? To make a statement and be remembered for the rest of days. You'll see around 2019, Elon Musk received a tremendous question on Joe Rogan's podcast. Is it tremendous? Have you ever looked at airplanes and thought, can I fix this? To provide context, Elon Musk discuss the imperfections of airplanes. And that's when Joe Rogan asks him the question. Pay close attention to his answer and stay calm. You'll see the connection it has with Starship. What? I have a design for airplanes. A better design? Probably yes. Yes, with that indifferent face, he casually says he has a better design than what hundreds of thousands of people have been doing for decades. And it only gets better. After that, he presents his concept. Some kind of electric aircraft with vertical takeoff and landing and supersonic. An electric plane that takes off and lands vertically. And on top of that is supersonic, yes. Of course, the next thing will be to make an electric starship rocket. Wait, could this possibly be a possibility, however remote? Well, let's analyze it. Starship has two stages. The first stage's purpose is to gain significant speed and altitude. It remains attached until leaving Earth's atmosphere, then detaches, and the second stage extends further. But almost in space, where friction is practically minimal. If we wanted to design an electric aircraft that would allow humans to leave the atmosphere, we could only do it with the first stage, because the second, when flying through space where there is no air around, needs to generate propulsion with a rocket engine that expels mass in one direction. So thanks to Newton's third law, it can move in the opposite direction. This is done by combustion engines. The first stage, when moving through the atmosphere, could use a kind of super electric motor at the back which would generate the necessary thrust. Could we replace all the Raptor engines to put an electric super engine? Add several air intakes along the ship so that all that air would be affected by the gigantic fan. That would generate upward force, that is thrust. In addition, since the Super Heavy is so large, all the internal ducts through which the air was entering could be used to slow down until the engine reached the optimal speed. One problem fighter planes have is that since they are very small, the air cannot slow down enough to reach the engine. After the electric motor, a convergent-divergent nozzle could be introduced to greatly accelerate the air at the exit. In fact, a critical point is that for an engine to generate thrust, it must expel the air faster than the aircraft is moving. Starship encounters no issues during the initial ascent from a standstill. As long as the engine slightly accelerates the air, thrust is generated since the aircraft is nearly stationary. But after accelerating for several seconds, the aircraft will be moving very fast. The separation between the first and second stage occurs when the aircraft reaches a speed of approximately 7, 0 miles which means that the air must exit the engine faster than that speed. And friends, I'm sorry to say that this is an absolute outrage, but this is not the worst of the problems, I guarantee you. By the way, this thing about the exit speed of the air has to be greater than the speed at which the ship is moving. Rocket engines don't experience this because the fuel and oxidizer are carried inside the structure, already moving at the aircraft's speed. Any acceleration in the opposite direction generates a force. The issue is that an aircraft using outside air must first decelerate it to operate with its engines, then accelerate it. Even more than what came in at the beginning, otherwise no thrust would be generated. An important point is that this first electric stage could only be used on planet Earth because there is no atmosphere on the moon and the density on Mars is extremely low. But this isn't a problem because Elon Musk's idea is that the first stage never leaves Earth. Basically, it would only serve to propel the second stage, but in all possible cases, it would return to land on Earth. Okay, so physically, the first stage could be electric, right? Well, I'll let you answer the question with what I'm going to tell you next. As a rocket ascends, the air density decreases not linearly, but exponentially. While it's true that this decreases the aerodynamic resistance and is something that benefits us, the thrust generated by our engine is also going to decrease because we're going to move less and less air mass. One possible option would be for the rings on our ship that let in air to gradually open. 
so that the amount of air mass that enters remains constant all the time. Another option would be to make the separation between the first and the second stage, at roughly 18 miles in altitude where the density is not extremely low. And this honestly could be done if we wanted to put a satellite in a low orbit. So far, the idea is insane, and only a disturbed person would attempt to implement it. Unfortunately, we haven't reached the part that makes this idea impossible. For this, we'll also use a very powerful approach, energy. Simple calculations can lead to powerful conclusions. Let's do it. In a circular orbit, there is one and only one speed for each altitude. This is determined with this graph. With this information, we learn that a satellite at an altitude of 10, 0 miles should travel at a speed of 3 miles, says. At 20,000 kilometers of altitude, the speed should be 3.8 kilometers per second at 40,000, 2.9 kilometers per second. As altitude increases and you orbit closer to Earth, you will need greater speed. Otherwise, its gravitational attraction will absorb you, but as the radius increases, the speed of the orbit decreases. Is that okay then? A 20-ton satellite orbiting at 400 kilometers altitude? It will have kinetic energy and potential energy. That is, it will have energy for moving very fast and for being at a certain altitude. The values shown on the screen were obtained by solving the kinetic and potential energy equations for this specific case. One important thing is that potential energy is always represented with a negative sign. To determine the energy cost of putting the satellite into orbit, I will make the potential energy positive and add it to the kinetic energy. In this way, we obtain the total energy of our satellite. The curious thing is that what we have obtained is not the energy it would have cost to put the satellite in that orbit. Unfortunately, with our current technology, launching 20 tons into orbit requires all of this. We practically have to put almost all of that into orbit. So it's not just the 20 tons of the satellite, but all the previous stuff too. Actually, this is quite complex because a rocket loses mass as it ascends because it burns all the fuel. The spacecraft rapidly loses significant mass between stages during separation. If you stop to think about it, the optimal thing would be for the rocket to weigh as little as possible so that it is not wasted. Energy in accelerating the structure of the spacecraft and that all the energy is focused on accelerating the satellite. A very curious way to take advantage of energy. Spin Launch is already developing it, a company that intends to accelerate a projectile a lot in such a way that it would already come out with very high energy from the launch. This would allow them to launch small rockets because not much fuel mass would be needed within the structure since much of the energy would be obtained in the launch itself. And one of the main problems we have in space exploration is that the amount of energy needed to reach orbit is tremendous. And currently all that energy comes in the form of fuel. Approximately 90% of a rocket's mass at the time of launch is fuel. Mind you, 90% of the mass is crazy. This means that a large part of the fuel is used to accelerate the structure of the ship, which is actually mostly fuel. We are expending significant energy to transport the fuel. It's a very inefficient thing, but currently it's the only thing we can do to put objects in orbit. Here is a real graph illustrating the case of Starship. The graph shows potential energy in red and kinetic energy in blue for an ascending rocket. The total energy, represented in green, is the sum of potential and kinetic energy. We can see how in this part, when getting rid of the first stage, there is a huge jump downwards. So in this way, we can see that everything that the graphs have gone down is what you are saving in energy by getting rid of that structure. A curious thing that can also be seen with these graphs is that, in the end, when the rocket is about to put the satellite into orbit, the kinetic energy and the potential energy decrease. This is because the rocket loses a lot of mass. As the mass drops rapidly, the kinetic and potential energy can decrease despite the increasing speed and decreasing altitude. But in any case, that would be the energy at a given moment. But all the energy that has been consumed up to that point is the sum of all the previous ones. Thus, the pink graph, representing the cumulative energy consumed, continues to rise. Okay, having made that clear, it's time to talk about fuel. As you may already know, Starship uses methane, which has an energy of 55 megajoules per kilogram. Considering it can carry the monstrous 3,400 tons of propellant in the first stage and 1,200 in the second, and knowing that the ratio is 72% liquid oxygen and 28% methane, the total energy that Starship can carry inside will be 7 times 10 to the power of 13 joules. 
Keep in mind, this means that any mission must require less energy than what we have obtained, otherwise Starship will not be able to carry it out. Although, we already know that the idea to go to Mars is to refuel in orbit because otherwise the numbers wouldn't add up. So with this information, we know that the altitude at which they can put a certain mass into orbit is limited by the amount of energy they can carry inside. Knowing moreover that there is a part of all that energy that they have to save for the landing because they have to turn the engines on again. Okay, so knowing how much energy the Super Heavy can carry, the one that uses methane, let's calculate how many batteries would be needed to carry the same amount of energy. Because let's not forget that we want to try to get an electric starship. Well, being very optimistic, we could assume that current batteries have 1.5 megajoules per kilogram. Keep in mind, this is an extremely optimistic outlook, and this value is about 36 times less than the energy per kilogram that methane contains. Although it's true that to operate with methane, you also have to carry a lot of oxygen, and this wouldn't be necessary with an electric motor. In summary, the spacecraft carries 952 tons of methane and 2,448 tons of liquid oxygen. In the Super Heavy, we would now have to carry 10 times more weight in the form of batteries. But that's not the worst of it all. The worst part is that batteries do not decrease in mass as energy is consumed, which is significant. The current Super Heavy holds 3,400 tons of propellant at launch. Several minutes later, that weight is completely eliminated. That's equivalent to 2,500 Toyota Corollas. The comparison would be the same. The red graph shows the sum of energies to put a conventional starship into orbit, the ones that use methane. The same graph is shown in blue. Now for a hypothetical case, assuming the starship's mass does not decrease. As fuel is consumed, you can see that the amount of energy consumed is much greater. Well, now we represent what would happen if the fuel weighed 10 times more, and on top of that, we didn't lose mass as we ascend. That's exactly what would happen if we carried batteries instead of carrying methane. We'll notice that the energy consumed compared to the others is so much that even the red and blue lines seem to be constant horizontal lines when we clearly know they are not. So Elon, I'm ahead of you because I'm sure you'll propose it on television in a few years. It's completely impossible to make a first electric stage until batteries can evolve to store much more energy per kilogram. Considering it doesn't make sense, this is what happens to airplanes as explained in a video on my channel. So that thing about having an idea for a supersonic electric vertical takeoff and landing plane? I really don't know how the numbers add up for him. Not to mention that the thrust would decrease significantly as the ship went up because the density goes down. Also, we don't have electric motors that provide enough power today. In summary, after disregarding many factors to conduct this study, the idea makes no sense at all. So fortunately for us, Starship is gonna make a lot, but a lot of noise for many years. Thanks for watching. Let me know your thoughts on electric rockets in the comments. See you next time.